Hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Farnoosh, the Head of Education, and I'm happy to be hosting today's session on an introduction to EEG eye tracking integration. Our presenter today is uh, William Royal, or Sam, who is a psychologist by background and is currently the lead psychology technician at Salford University in UK and the secretary for the Association of Technical Staff in Psychology. He's been examining system integration for many years and investigating methods for avoiding interference in the data during eye tracking, VR, EEG, FNIRS, etc. After his presentation, he will also show us a quick video of EEG eye tracking to give us a first-hand impression of how the setup would actually look like. There will be a short Q&A afterwards, and you can send your questions already in the questions chat box in the meantime. Also, you will see some poll questions in the course of the presentation, which require your active participation to keep the session more interactive. So let's get started. Sam, thank you for joining and accepting our invitation. Uh, we're all looking forward to your presentation. Um, let us know whenever you have the poll questions and we will raise them for you. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for attending. This is the kind of exposure that I could only have dreamed of in my nightmares, really. Um, obviously, as a technician, much of my teaching is done in small groups. Um, so it's really amazing to have so many people logged on already. Um, so yesterday, um, I'd like to talk to, a bit, uh, to you a bit about uh, EEG and eye tracking integration. But I guess the, the kind of place to start, um, ignoring content, uh, really uh, is with me um, so briefly to add to Farnoosh's wonderful introduction I've been working around um, data integration for the last five years or so since I joined the University of Salford say so early work involved some uh, testing the uh, feasibility of com combining virtual reality methods with uh, functional near infrared spectroscopy we've also been working on doing functional near infrared spectroscopy and eye tracking work uh, i'll come back to why this presentation is not on that in a little while um, but also we've been looking into eeg eye tracking integration as well um, and i'm going to start by hopefully getting to know a little bit uh, about the audience so could we throw the first poll up straight away please Lovely. Um, I guess yeah, I shall. And we will give this 30 seconds. 30. Lovely. Okay, sorry, I was muted. So, uh, interestingly, uh, we've got 6% um, of the participants who want to see you embarrassed. That's most important. Um, and the majority of uh, the audience is uh, um, basically postgraduates. Postgraduates. Wonderful. Yeah. So, um, hopefully, this is, is going to be uh, pitched at the right level and interesting for you. Um, I'm going to start with a bit more of a philosophical hook um, to set some context. And one of the things I was thinking about in the process of putting together this webinar was actually the etymology of the word focus. Um, this was originally a, a physicist's word. It was used in 17th century literature to describe the point at which uh, light that has passed through a lens converges. 
And I just thought that was a really interesting point to start in terms of how we now use focus as a word to describe a lot of other things. When we talk about things being our focus, they're the center of our attention. Um, and I think it's an interesting demonstration of how the kind of primary physical way we interact with the world influences our cognition. So this obviously leads nicely into some ideas in uh, visual cognition. Um, and it has been argued that vision is the dominant sense for humans, so it's really important in, in informing our worldview. And uh, Kavana introduced, well, didn't introduce, discusses uh, this topic area of visual cognition as something that's been studied for a long time, but never explicitly called visual cognition, at least until the last 10 years or so. And this visual cognition isn't just about how we measure the world with our eyes, um, but also how we use that information to construct models of objects, surfaces, and make inferences. And Kavana termed this uh, idea, this term, inferential vision, which I think is a really nice way of capturing uh, the importance of the interactions between our eyes and our brain. So obviously this is leading nicely into the topic of today's uh, webinar, which is specifically about methods that allow us to measure the eye and the brain. So why EEG? Well, if you look at the kind of table here, we have a typical representation of the strengths and weaknesses of the major uh, imaging methodologies used, certainly in psychology. Um, fMRI obviously has great spatial resolution, EEG great temporal resolution, but really the driving decision behind EEG for this particular work is fMRI is very expensive, it's something that's going to be unavailable to a lot of people, and as I mentioned earlier we've been doing work around EEG, uh, sorry, functional near-infrared spectroscopy and eye tracking, and one of the issues there is uh, interference in the data sources, obviously they're both based on infrared uh, imaging methods so uh, we are unfortunately being delayed in the work uh, we're doing on that because of the ongoing pandemic but hopefully we'll have some pilot data once we can get the labs open again so EEG a sensible choice for today's uh, discussion could we have poll number two please Right, more than 70% of the people um, responded to the poll. And uh, basically, 33% uh, I've used EEG, but not eye tracking. And then 29% I've used EEG and eye tracking, but not together. Then we've got I've never used EEG or eye tracking at 60%, 16%. And um, yeah. 13% uh, I've used eye tracking but not EEG and the last one 9% I'm already experiencing both. Lovely, um, well again hopefully there'll be something interesting for everyone here even if you are experienced there might be um, just a nugget or two of information that you might find interesting. Um, we're obviously going to be focusing on this as a kind of introduction. Um, so it's nice to kind of see that there's a breadth of experience here in terms of the people that are using or uh, have used EEG, have used eye tracking. Um, there's some points that will be uh, useful to come back to later on that. Um, okay, so we've said EEG is how we might want to measure the brain in terms of a visual cognition related study. Um, eye tracking, this is my typical joke and it occurs to me that with this audience it may have absolutely no meaning. Uh, I suspect this was probably a British thing, um, but there was the old uh, Ron Seal advert about it does exactly what it says on the tin. So eye tracking does what it says on the tin, it tracks where our eyes are looking, um, but for a more useful explanation, the way these things typically work is that we have some kind of illumination, usually with infrared light. Uh, we image the eye uh, using some kind of camera, usually infrared cameras, uh, and we use this to detect the pupil, which appears obviously as a very white uh, 
bright white spot in infrared light or under the infrared camera. Um, this kind of modeling of the eye um, is improved with things like the Perkeen reflections, which you can see in the image on the right of the slide there. Um, we obviously have to calibrate for eye tracking. We can't do uh, or measure where the eyes are looking without knowing a kind of starting point. So there's a calibration procedure. We measure what the eyes are doing over a period of time, and then we can calculate where somebody's looking, whether that be on a screen or within a particular scene. So why are these two technologies interesting to integrate? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, and I'll talk about them in kind of broadly two categories. And this will certainly, or this slide certainly leads into the first of those categories, which is improving data quality. So traditional EEG approaches have used unnatural vision conditions where you're usually required to sit perfectly still with a perfectly fixed gaze right on the center of a screen. And obviously that's just not how we behave in the real world. Um, beyond this, when you did get eye movements in those studies, you were discarding the trials that were creating the issues, uh, and that overall creates a reduced signal to noise ratio and makes it harder for us to uh, find effects where they exist. So EEG has these limitations that are related to the eye. We'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment, um, but could we have poll three, please? Paul just started. Thank you. All right, here are the results. So almost half of the participants voted for the last one, all of the above, and then 19% to complement the interpretation of EEG data with eye tracking information. And um, to, uh, to complement the interpretation of eye tracking with EEG goes the third, and uh, the other two are 8% and 9% only. Lovely. Well, uh, I'm going to make it my aim to persuade all of you to pick all of the above by the end of the presentation, obviously. Um, there's lots of advantages we can uh, utilise from this combination, and I'll get into those in just a moment. So, um, I was talking about how we kind of talk about uh, I motion artifacts coming through in uh, electroencephalography EEG data and the reason that this happens is because uh, the eye is itself essentially a magnet and we have what's called the cornea retinal dipole um, with the positive pole at the cornea and the negative pole at the back of the eye so you've got a, a magnet essentially in your head right next to your brain and right next to where we're recording changes in voltage essentially um, so the electrophysiology of the eye is very similar to the electrophysiology that we're applying when we talk about EEG in general. The difference being that the eye is a big dipole that we can measure at the scalp on its own, whereas obviously EEG signals are the product of synchronous brain activity. So that's what we're showing here essentially. So movements of the eye, since it's a magnet, will introduce current at a, an electrode, at a wire. Um, but the key words that we're really interested in here is movement. It's movements of the eye that are making issues within our EEG data. So how does the eye move? Well, there's a number of different kinds of movements that the eye uses. Essentially, um, we have the saccadic movements that you know move between fixations, um, and these have a certain characteristic profile. Um, you can see something uh, or a graph on the right here, which represents uh, a saccade um, to fixation. 
and what we have on the blue line is the total movement and the red line represents acceleration so you can see we have this kind of initial movement um, that stabilizes and then we usually have a, a kind of correction movement undershooting uh, we also have a number of other uh, uh, smaller kind of eye movements that are regularly going on so if we're obviously following something across the screen we get these smooth uh, movements of the eyes that are helping to correct our fixations we also have uh, nystagmoid movements which are what we can kind of see in the bottom right corner there where the kind of twitching of the eye um, creates a very jagged signal and then obviously as well we have blinks and eyelid movement so uh, with blinks you've got uh, muscular uh signals being generated as well uh, and you've also got movement of the eye within the blink that can create artifacts within eeg data so one of the considerations i've had in looking at eye tracking particularly for improving data is how does it compare to methods that are already employed widely and obviously the major way of dealing with uh, eye tracking artifacts in EEG has typically been to measure electro-oculograms, so electrical signals from the eye that can be there, then be removed from the electrical signals taken from the scalp. Um, but what I've tended to think about is partly my own situation where I don't actually have access to an EOG, um, so having some other way to filter my data is really useful. Um, but also that there's potential for improved accuracy through eye tracking. We can avoid things like muscular artifacts from the EOG. And again, I'm obviously a big fan of combining lots of different methods, so I don't see any reason why they couldn't be put together if you're in a fortunate enough a situation. So, as we say, eye tracking has potential utility in improving our EEG data. And there's a few different ways we can actually do that. Um, obviously, we can mark eye movements above a certain threshold within our eye tracking data to remove things from the EEG. That's the kind of traditional approach that has been taken anyway. Um, we can use tricks like gaze contingent progression, which essentially means that the uh, task or trial that we're presenting to a participant only progresses according to their engagement with the task itself uh, and i'll have a little bit of a demonstration of a gaze contingent paradigm later on but there are also more advanced methods for improving your eeg data and the clever people out there i must say this wasn't my first approach my first thought was along uh, the electrical modeling of uh, the eye uh, electrophysiological modeling of the eye to then take an approach much like you would with EOG. Other people have better ideas um, and we'll come on to the primary one of those in a moment. Could I have poll number four please? All right, we have a fair distribution among psychologists, um, people from multidisciplinary uh, areas and other, uh, all of them around 28, 29, and then health and sports, both of them 10%. Lovely. Well, that's, that's quite a nice broad range there. Um, again, I have a, an agenda with my questions. Uh, I'm hoping that by the end of today, I can persuade you all that multidisciplinary approaches are the way we need to go. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is while investigating these ideas around uh, minimizing uh, motion artifacts or ocular artifacts in electro or EEG data using eye tracking, uh, the approaches I've come across aren't largely derived from psychology or neuroscience they're derived initially quite often from other areas um, and signal processing image processing is one that comes up 
a lot. Uh, and indeed, this is where the ideas around component analysis uh, were, I believe, originally kind of applied. Um, certainly, you see a lot of the development with things done nowadays where they're, they're separating out visual components and then they're applied further into other areas. So independent component analysis is a, I say, a computational method for decomposing signals. So we're looking for the independent signals that lead up to or add up to the overall signal. In EEG, what we do is we can identify the independent signals and then we can try to identify which ones are produced by noise and which ones are produced by an actual neuronal signal. So to give a kind of visual representation of that, what you can see here is our original signal. It's jumbled up. It's actually just four images that I've laid over with different transparency. Um, but in the process of independent component analysis, what we're doing is drawing out these different components, the bits that actually went in, and then we can look to identify again, which ones are neuronal, which ones are noise. So, it's a commonly used method for filtering EEG data, but I say the big question here is then that final step. How do you determine what's neuronal and what's noise? Um, and essentially by combining eye tracking data into this method, what we can do is start to match the components that we see in the EEG and the components that we see in our eye tracking data. So uh, there was a method developed by Plockel et al, this is a paper from 2012, um, and they compared the performance of three different methods for filtering EEG data. Two of them, traditional EOG-based regression methods, um, and one with this independent component analysis that incorporated uh, eye tracking components. So uh, the approach they developed was automated, always really useful because it means it's adaptable to the different kinds of eye movements that are going on. Um, so potentially can deal with things like the small nystagmoid movements as much as it can deal with things like the saccadic movements. Um, and when these eye tracking components or the, the components that were identified to be caused within the eye tracking or matched from the eye tracking to the EEG were removed, um, we saw uh, the ICA outperformed both regression approaches, um, was comparative to human experts when humans are given all the information they could ever want, um, better than experts in non-ideal situations, and had these balanced false positives and false negatives. So eye tracking data can be fed into these um, approaches, but to do so, we need to start thinking about understanding signal uh, decomposition um okay that's obviously very useful and we can potentially start to filter eeg data but what about saccadic movements what do they do to eeg data they do create um, issues and that's an area that's still being worked on and obviously there are as i say more advanced approaches to morphological uh, to component analysis or signal decomposition including this morphological component analysis which is supposed to be better at not distorting uh, the data Okay, so that's my, uh, I guess, summary of um, where you might want to begin when looking at combining EEG and eye tracking in terms of uh, how you can use this to improve data. But what about what we can actually learn from combining the different methods? Well, uh, as we were discussing before the webinar began, um, there are many situations in which just because something is presented or something is on a screen, uh, this doesn't mean that somebody is going to look at the stimulus or take it in in any way. Um, so when we carry out traditional EEG research where we're presenting things on screens, one of the risks is that we're not getting real data because the participant isn't really engaging. And gaze contingent paradigms are one way we can address that. Again, I've mentioned uh, this is essentially a task that progresses based on the participant's gaze-based engagement. Um, we can also start to improve uh, how we're picking the points in our EEG data where we want to run our analyses. If we're looking at um, event-related potentials, ERPs, 
um, then we can actually change that to be something more like a fixation related potential. So we can look at the engagement with a stimulus um, rather than just the presentation of an event um, in terms of our EEG data. And there's a number of different examples where this has been applied, including in things like object identification and emotional valence. But one of the other big uh, advantages of combining uh, eye tracking and EEG is definitely that we get um, the added benefits of eye tracking measures. Pupillometry being a big one, um, arousal and cognitive load have all been assessed um, using pupillometry. So there's um, extra reasons there to, to benefit from uh, the eye tracking on top of just being able to improve our data. In terms of analysis, I'm not going to be going into any depth on this today. If it's something that interests people, then um, I guess let the guys at Ant and Toby know and they can either approach me or somebody else to um, produce something on that. Um, but as I say, with uh, moving to combining EEG and eye tracking rather than just taking EEG data on its own, uh, we can essentially move from event related to vision related uh, analyses. So as well as fixations, it would be possible to look at even micro saccade and saccade related um, ERPs essentially. And uh, one of the thoughts, perhaps less formed than I would like at this point, uh, but based on a discussion I had with uh, one of my colleagues who's been a great support in uh, developing this webinar page, shout outs, um, is we were talking about the idea of synchrony based investigations as well. Um, so we know that changes in pupil size are associated with underlying neuronal brain potentials um, and we kind of developing questions around, well, how does that influence uh, or interact with different states? For example, the flow state, do we see an increase in the synchrony of uh, signals there? So how is this all applied in real life? How is it useful? Um, I come from an applied psychology department, so this is always a useful thing to think about. And uh, much as my orientation is always towards research, it's always useful to see um, these things in action. So one of the kind of major areas that you see EEG and eye tracking applied together is in um, prosthesis rejection. Um, obviously, there are a number of reasons that people end up with prostheses um, and adjusting to a prosthetic can be very difficult. Many people stop using them because of the difficulty um, and there's research that shows that you are having to increase your cognitive effort to do things with a prosthesis um, and this is kind of in line with theories around the development of mastery and training so uh, in this research from Paratal, um, which included some members of the northwest visual cognition group who have also informed uh, the talk today um, they uh, used a gaze-based uh, training system uh, for people using myoelectric prostheses. So this was initially with people who had normal hands and then with people who didn't. Um, and the principle of this training is essentially that as we develop mastery in a concept or in a task, uh, our eyes move ahead of our hands is the basic idea. We no longer need to look at exactly what we're doing with our hands to do this. And uh, this could be in simple tasks such as just picking something up, moving it and putting it down. You see people who are using the prostheses for the first time really have to, to look at what they're doing. Um, what they showed is that engaging in this kind of gaze training where they use eye tracking to show people how they can improve their their gaze or make it more like a, uh, somebody who's efficient to task, um, both improved their ability to engage with the tasks, um, reduced gaze shifting, so reduced the, the amount of time they essentially had to spend looking at their hand uh, and yet saw a, a loss in uh, or at least a reduction in the amount of cognitive effort that needs to be applied to use the prosthetics. So I thought that was a really nice kind of application where the EEG and the eye tracking have both informed uh, this really useful intervention. From a more nerdy standpoint, uh, I'm obviously a technician and the idea of brain computer interfacing is one that's always interested me. Um, uh, so 
brain computer interface work lots of it has been carried out under the basis of eeg work um, and again this is largely because of the temporal benefits of eeg it's quite quick um, so you don't have to wait for that data you can theoretically then feed it back into a system quickly um, However, the kind of early work on uh, brain computer interfaces where they're trying to show that, you know, they can identify things happening in, in the brain that are specifically related to something that's on screen or something that's being done, um, used very unusual or at least not usual, not real world um, tasks. So there's the oddball task, which I'm sure anybody who's been using EEG will be aware of. Um, checkerboard frequency presentations as well. Um, these BCIs obviously had a very limited realism. So they, they were successful. They were able to, to show when people were engaging with particular stimuli. Um, but if you're, you're again sat staring at the center of a screen, it's not very, very realistic. Um, Fink et al uh, advanced on this by using the combination with eye tracking and what they did is allowed for a more natural search task so uh, a free search task but using a gaze contingent keyhole so this is essentially where you have a mask over your screen and you can only see the bit you're looking at otherwise participants were able to, to engage in free viewing which is obviously much more realistic um, they used fixation related potentials uh, and looked for P300 signals. And what they found is that when they had uh, uh, fixation on the target and the P300 um, signal, they were able to essentially distinguish um, fixations on targets, fixations on non-targets non and fixations on the background. So again, that combination of EEG and eye tracking uh, improves the uh, functioning of the brain computer interface and obviously long term that could have huge effects in terms of accessibility technologies etc okay excuse me so that um i guess is the part of the webinar where I talk about why you might want to combine EEG and eye tracking together. Um, hopefully you'll see now that there are benefits to um, both the data quality, um, certainly in terms of the EEG, um, but also in terms of being able to study a wider range of research questions by incorporating things like pupillometry and also by combining those methods um, to look at things like fixation related potentials as well. But how do we actually do this? How do we get different pieces of equipment to work together? Um, I obviously said a little while ago that I want to persuade everybody that you should be multidisciplinary. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is that I think at least being able to have a basic understanding of all the different steps involved is really important in, in fully understanding and therefore being able to interpret your data. Um, in terms of signal processing, we've obviously talked about, say, that comes from potentially visual uh, areas, uh, but also physics. Uh, I work with functional near infrared spectroscopy, as I've said several times, so I have to understand the physics of light. Um, we also have to understand, obviously, what's going on with electrical signals for EEG. Um, but the key point, uh, I guess, for the rest of this seminar is, seminar, webinar, is um, you know, how do we actually make those pieces of data line up? Um, and the key idea here is that we need time synchronization. We need to be able to know that this thing that's happening in the, the EEG data stream matches up to this thing that's happen happening in our eye tracking data stream. And this can be done in a number of, uh, number of ways. Uh, the one I'll be talking about today is TTL signals. So these are electrical signals sent via a cable. Um, but there are other options for time synchronization as well. Uh, lab streaming layer is um, very useful if you uh, want to be able to do this on the network um, and potentially if you're wanting to combine 
quite a number of devices as well. Cable management becomes difficult. Um, but there are also third party software solutions that are becoming available um, for those who are interested in them. Uh, iMotions, I believe, offers one. I've never used that system. And I believe Noldus are in development of one at the moment and looking to offer that later this year. They might be in a beta now. Um, but there's a few different options in terms of how you can actually manage this. Uh, as I say, we'll stick with the simple one today, which is sending a TTL signal through a cable. The other thing we need to think about, obviously, is what are we actually going to be synchronizing? Um, we need to obviously, as I say, be able to identify these same points in all of our data streams. Um, so we've got, in this particular instance, we've certainly got an EEG signal, we've got a, a, eye tracking information, we might be using external presentation software and with that we might also have events that we want to mark in the data as well. So for the most part this is achieved as I say with uh, cables that send a 3.3 or 5 volt uh, TTL signal that looks something like the image on the right here. Uh, our software can then look for these sorts of square waves of an electrical signal turning on and off uh, to identify where events are happening. Okay, so uh, here's just a few rough examples of how we might connect up those um, pieces of equipment and I'm hopefully going to be able to show you a couple of these in action, um, if not via live demo then certainly via video. Um, so the first setup we have here is essentially uh, quite a simple setup. Toby Pro Lab um, is our computer, top thing at cross on at the top there. Um, we can use that potentially for both uh, our measurement of the eyes and for presentation of stimuli. Toby Pro Lab is a big improvement on Toby Pro Studio uh, in terms of the functionalities there. Um, I must say as well, gaze contingent progression is really easy to implement in the new version of Toby Pro Lab. They've introduced uh, a gaze trigger that's really useful for that. Um, and obviously from Toby Pro Lab, what we can do is trigger a parallel port signal, a TTL, to be sent to the Ego amplifier. So again, I'm using, in particular, Toby uh, eye trackers and uh, the Ego uh, Sport 32 system um, myself. Um, so that's kind of what I'm talking about here, but there'd, there'd be roughly similar setups for other systems as well. Uh, in this case, I'm also using a portable eye tracker. So at the moment, I'm actually using an X260, which is a bit of an older eye tracker, but um, I have an external processing unit for that one. So there's actually an external processing unit uh, dealing with the eye tracking on this particular setup. Um, so just to show you this one, I think I will uh, utilize the video I've got. Um, so hopefully we can get this to show properly. Uh, I just need to move all these things out of the way. Um, so, going to skip a little way in here. Uh, this is Toby Pro Lab. Um, what you can see here is the experiment builder. Uh, essentially, what I'll do here is build a gaze contingent oddball. And basically, this is a really simple uh, task to build in, a, say, Toby Pro Lab. Um, so first, we're obviously going to need some instructions, um, not very tidy. Um, the other thing I'll mention at this point is if you are going to be building in Toby Pro Lab, I recommend using uh, your or setting your screen resolution at the start so that you don't uh, have to come back and start tweaking these things later. I'm actually at the moment on a very non-ideal system, which given that today we're talking about uh, EEG, and there's therefore an importance for the accuracy and precision of these uh, signals that we're using for time synchronization. I'm not going to say I can rely on the, the ones I get from this particular setup perfectly. Um, a number of reasons for that include that actually this recording was taken on an old TV being used for a monitor. It has a resolution of 1360 by 768, um, which is odd even for an old device. Um, so getting things to present at the native resolution is very difficult. Um, these are things to be aware of. 
Um, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, what you can see here is that uh, we're using the group functionality within Toby Pro Lab to actually uh, break up our timeline into a series of bits that repeat. Um, so we have a fixation, we're going to have a number of things that are presented before the blank, uh, and then we'll repeat that process 10 times as defined by the blocks group in that top timeline. So I've just added a bunch of stimuli in here, um, or at least I'm adding a bunch of stimuli into these folders, uh, and these are going to be our oddball images. So essentially I have a bunch of images of glasses of water, and I have a bunch of images of beer. I do alcohol-related research, so this was an easy in for me. Um, for those who don't know, the oddball paradigm essentially involves presenting uh, images in sequence, and uh, you have an odd Ball, an odd image, uh, something that is categorized differently in some way, um, presented at a regular interval. This allows you to either uh, look for P300 waves in ERPs that occur after the presentation of the novelty stimulus, or you can also look for um, responses at the frequency of the presentation of the oddball. So it's a fairly traditional EEG task. Um, okay, so here's the important bit here's the gaze contingency. Um, in Toby Pro Lab, it really is as simple as clicking a button uh, and dragging this uh, box into place. Simple as that. Um, we can also set a duration there. So I set it to progress after 300 milliseconds. I'm obviously not too fussed at the moment. This is just an example recording. Um, but now we can obviously think about how that's going to interact with uh, Ego as well, our method for collecting our actual EEG data. Um, and Toby Pro Lab uh, allows us to essentially click a button. You can see it at the bottom right of the screen there that sends stimulus markers via TTL on a parallel port. So the end result of our little study here, you can see above uh, alongside the signals being sent to our EEG in the top right hand corner. Uh, you will have to excuse that they're a little out of time. That is due to my video editing skills, not the systems not being in time. Um, but you should be able to see that we obviously get a C1 marker, as it is on this particular instance, that represents our fixation. Um, we get a number of markers representing the presentation of each of the images. And hopefully you'll be able to see as well that the progression here is only happening when uh, the gaze is on the fixation cross. Okay. Simple implementation, um, hopefully we can all see we've got marks in there and obviously from this point there are a number of ways that we can then take that to analyse post uh, data collection. So long as we can say we know that this is where these recordings match up, this is where they start together, um, we can then do a lot of things with that data in a variety of different ways. So that should be our simple setup. Um, there are obviously more complex setups that you can manage. Um, this actually is the, the simple one. So you can see here, um, it's not actually plugged into the computer, but that's our, uh, the awkward PC that I've mentioned uh, that I'm doing the eye tracking on hooked up to the Ego amplifier. Um, if you want to do more complex um, procedures, something like the masking we discussed, or I mentioned uh, in terms of the keyhole masking on the brain-computer interface research, uh, then you might need to start looking at other presentation software. And there's a number of different options that you can look at. Um, Psychopy uh, and Python obviously enable you to do these sorts of things. There's a package called Titter that's available to help you interact with Toby devices specifically. Uh, and obviously Psychopy itself can do uh, parallel port triggering uh, or you can write your own code components to do that. Um, in terms of E-Prime, there is E-Prime extensions for Toby if you're looking at this particular combination um, and that actually allows you to run E-Prime alongside Toby Pro Lab on the same device, um, works really nicely. Um, but again, those software packages are going to enable you to do the things like uh, the keyhole masking or other uh, more complex procedures. Uh, and I do say, obviously, you may be able to automate fixation related trigger signals, but that might depend on how you want to treat your eye tracking data. There are a number of obviously different algorithms through which you can 
identify fixations. So uh, whether you can apply those and manage timing in real time um, would be a piece of work. And finally, um, the last setup I'll talk about today is, um, I suppose, the most exciting one, certainly for uh, Rob, who will be joining us in a little while for the Q&A, um, as our Toby representative, which is the combination of Toby Pro glasses with uh, our Ego Sport 32. Now, this is obviously a really interesting combination because they're both portable systems, um, so it's potential or gives you the potential to go out and collect data in the real world. Um, as you can see in the diagram, you can fit it all in a rucksack. Um, and the signaling here is obviously a bit different because we don't have events occurring on our primary computer to determine when signals should be sent. Rather, we just have a kind of consistent signal that starts with uh, three as you can see at the bottom image there, there's three C1s in quite quick succession, and then uh, a pulse every 10 seconds as well. Arguably, the pulse every other 10 seconds from then on isn't necessary if you don't stop the recording. Um, I tend to leave things connected anyway. Uh, and hopefully, though we're running short on time, I should be able to quickly uh, throw in a demonstration with some of that. Um, so, let's see. It's updated my view, yep, lovely. So this is the Toby Pro glasses controller software. Um, I actually do have uh, my glasses plugged in at the moment. So hopefully we can load these up. Marvelous, okay, uh, one moment. Apologies that I have to take the headset off to uh, put those on. I'm going to try and keep my head reasonably stable so that you can see things that are going on, but I figured that the easiest way for me to show things connecting uh, would be to show them live. Um, so as you can see, uh, I've got my eye tracker PC over here. Um, we also have an EEG device um, somewhat ready to go over here. I've been hooked up for a while. Um, so I can't guarantee that the impedances will be great. Uh, let's just get the amp on and start displaying something here. And it probably would help if I did up my chin strap, but I'm not sure that there's time for me to worry about the data quality right now. Um, so just to show you, this is obviously our Toby Pro Glasses controller. This is uh, essentially the same for the Toby Pro Glasses 2 and 3. I'm using the 2 currently, um, though 3, um, from what I gather, has a number of essential or very useful benefits, including improving the field of view on the camera. Um, the Ego connection is very simple. Uh, Ego obviously has a dedicated trigger port, um, which we can see here, and there is an adapter cable that changes out to a parallel port. Uh, we also have a dedicated cable bought from uh, Ant, um, which has a parallel port end. You could use uh, different cables as well. This simply plugs in here. And the uh, two connections on the other end uh, for the Toby device. The important one here really is the three and a half millimeter connector. This is what actually carries our TTL signals. And if I remember correctly, the tip receives, the middle ring sends, and the bottom is the ground, but you can check that information in the manual. Um, and if we plug this in here, the USB, if I understand correctly, and I'm sure my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, just helps to charge the battery from the Ego device. Lovely. So I have the EEG running. I'm ready to start recording with my eye tracking glasses, uh, or at least I will be once I calibrate. What do we do? Let's try that again. Well, 
doesn't matter so much right now. I never usually have trouble calibrating, but there we go. So the important thing here is again, um, there's a couple of ways we can trigger the ego to record. So at the moment, I'm not actually recording, but if I start the recording on the eye tracker, do. Uh, you'll see that we can actually trigger the ego to begin the recording uh, under the basis of uh, starting the eye tracking recording. Um, hopefully that was obvious. Um, it's quite hard to look in two places at once. Uh, the alternative, as we showed before, um, is that you will get a three uh, a set of three triggers at 50 milliseconds so if this time i start a recording uh, not going to worry about the data signal uh, let's stop the one here restart the recording Doom. Hopefully you'll see we get three signals coming through to the EEG. Hopefully that's all clear. Um, I'll now jump back out of our uh, eye tracking glasses for the moment. Um, I do have a few final little points, but I'm also aware of the time. So I'm gonna jump through these very quickly um, so that there's time for questions. Here's what the general setup looks like in terms of uh, the the ego and the glasses together. It's very comfortable. I wore it for about an hour yesterday with no issues. Um, final points, to get good EEG data, you're going to need to understand EEG. There are accessible papers. Please do uh, make sure you understand that. And the same is true of eye tracking. If we want to understand eye tracking or get good data from eye tracking, we need to understand it. Um, we also need to consider what our research questions are. Um, how we apply things obviously depends on the question we want to answer and the analysis we intend to apply. I've had too many students run headlong into data collection without realising they're missing something they need. Um, finally, uh, the ideas of measurement, measurement, we must be transparent and accurate. Obviously, when we process EEG data and uh, eye tracking data, we are changing it and we need to make sure that people can replicate that to make sure that our science is uh, good science. Uh, and finally, uh, obviously, we've been talking about EEG today, which is really important, uh, or it's really important to maintain the temporal accuracy and precision. The only way to do that, if you want to be sure, is to make sure you've measured it for your situation using your equipment. Um, and finally, some general lessons from the lab. If you're unsure about your data, check it. It's easy to forget little things like unplugging a charger or something like that. Um, don't disregard low-tech solutions. I found that cardboard, glue and tape can be much uh, quicker and useful tools to uh, do things than waiting to have access to a 3D printer, for example. Um, listen to your technicians. I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Uh, we obviously don't want grease on our eye trackers and we wanna make sure our uh, EEG headsets are cleaned properly. And finally, uh, as a technician, I think the, the lesson that perhaps a lot of students don't um, pick up massively early is that things are going to go wrong, at least to start with and it helps to run through those things that go wrong with somebody who can help somebody who's friend colleague um, rather than jumping headlong into data collection um, so that's everything from me i will um let farnoosh jump in and in introduce uh, our other panelists i guess at this point thank you sam for this great practical presentation sharing your valuable experience about the challenges and solutions when integrating these two technologies uh, very helpful as both toby pro and ego systems have gone through major changes in their recent release we thought it might be a good idea to hear some highlights about the changes in the software um, so we have antonia here who is the senior application specialist in a and 
Um, and we have invited Rob, who is director at Toby Pro in Latin America, to share a few words with us. So, Antonia, thanks for joining. We look forward to hearing about the improvements. I just give you the presentation access. We can't hear you, Antonia. There you go. Yeah, now. Pardon me. Now. Great. Okay, hello everybody. I'm Antonia, the Senior Application Specialist for ANT Neuro. And as mentioned by Farnoosh, I will just quickly go over the um, some highlighted new software features that we have implemented in our latest release. Um, mostly, um, I will focus on those that actually uh, fit very nicely into Sam's presentation that were either directly already mentioned by him or it can be an extension um, to something that he has uh, told you about. So for example, in our newest release, we have a little bit expanded and improved our dry electrode module for those interested to actually work with dry um, EEG electrodes. We have added um, support for an SpO2 sensor that I, am, uh, I have currently wearing on my finger and I will show you quickly how that looks in, e in EGO. We have added a web uh, server remote control, which is also something that Sam has mentioned that goes into this um, possibility of controlling more than one device at the time. Uh, we have improved patient recording management. We have extended LSL support. Again, this was briefly um, mentioned by Sam. LSL is becoming more and more important when we try to synchronize the signal or um, the recording setups across different types of devices. Um, and I will also show this quickly um, in my demo. And uh, we have improved data safety, and we can now also support a wider range of third-party CAP setups directly in EGO. <laughs> So to go into my presentation, um, basically what you're going to see here on the right, uh, on the left is um, the uh, screen from EGO. And what I have done here today, because Sam so perfectly already showed us the EEG signal, I'm actually only gonna focus on additional modalities because as Sam mentioned, Sam mentioned, sometimes it's very important that we can actually acquire data for more than just one acquisition modality and best to do so in one single file so that we know that the data is already synchronized from the very beginning. Sam showed us how we can actually integrate the signal from the Toby glasses directly into our EG recordings via TTL triggers. Nonetheless, I would like to point out that we also permit for adding simple things such as bipolar channels. So up here in, in the, uh, on the upper line, the red line, is actually a bipolar recording of my e um, ECG. So I actually attach two bipolar electrodes to my shoulders. If you don't believe me, here they move. So you can actually see my heart rate in real time. The three uh, green lines that are below are actually from an accelerometer. Now imagine that you're actually eye tracking uh, whilst you're doing your EEG recordings. More than just knowing where a person is looking in time, it might also be interesting to know when they are actually turning their head and fixating in a bigger way, especially if they're walking through a real environment. In black, you see all the data that is provided by the SpO2 sensor. So you can see my heartbeat, you can see my um, oxygenation saturation, which is very good. This is good, I am alive at the moment. And now to go to the a little bit more extended features, here on the right panel, you can actually see the aforementioned web interface, the web controller. So what the web controller lets you do is actually see how many devices are actually ego devices are plugged into your local network. It lets you control them in the way that it lets you see who is attached with which sampling rate, which battery power, and what it does very nicely, it lets you start recording on all the devices at the same time. This way, you don't have to worry about a lot of the post-synchronization of the, of the data files. Another way that we provide to make sure that your, your data recordings are synchronous is that you can send annotations to all the devices at the same time directly over this web control. Now, this is a very simple way to show you how we can import LSL events into EGO, but we would also like to pull, point out that we have, with our extended LSL support, have increased the possibility to also, while you're recording in EGO, directly stream your um, data, your EEG data and bipolar channel data into uh, tertiary um, LSL uh, software, such as the lab recorder, if you want to work with something like this. Now, this was just a very quick, demo of what our new and improved um, EGO software can do. If you have any questions, I will be around for further uh, Q&As after uh, the next presentation from Rob. Thank you.
Thank you, Antonia. Very helpful and impressive changes indeed. So, Rob, uh, would you like to give us an impression of the new Topi classes? Hi there. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity of saying a few words. I don't have a presentation or a real demo. Sam did that already. Great job. A little bit risky to do a live demo, but uh, he did a good job there. Um, so my name is uh, Robertino Pereira, and, uh, or just in short, Rob, as everyone calls me. And uh, today I'm actually helping a little bit more behind the scenes. I've worked for the past 12 years or so with eye tracking and EEG in Europe in the UK and Latin America, and I'm the uh, director of Toby Pro Latam, the office in Chile in Latin America. Um, at Toby, a little bit as Sam mentioned, at Toby we work with a very wide range of clients, from academic clients, but we also have commercial clients, and they usually uh, use uh, or come from a background of psychology and neuroscience, but also economics, sports, medical marketing, training and actually everywhere where it's important to understand decision making or emotions, cognitive workload or in general like human behavior. In the webinar today, uh, Sam showed you how to sync the glass too uh, with the ANT products. And um, but interestingly, just a few weeks ago, we actually launched a new generation of mobile eye tracker that looks like this. Let me show that. That's the glasses too. Uh, here we go. So these are the new Toby Glasses 3, and they come with a lot of improvements, as Sam also pointed a little bit. Um, to state the obvious, there has been improvement in design, as you can see, which now makes them look a lot more like normal glasses, making it also feel more normal for the participants, because we want to measure normal, natural behavior. Uh, we now embedded the eye tracking uh, cameras into the glass, as you can see here maybe, and making them more robust and uh, resistant, but also important these days, making them easier to clean if you need it. Um, the new version also allows for better outdoor tracking, so more uh, research outdoors, and we made the angles of the scene camera recording wider and also higher. So there's a lot more of a uh, visual field that you can measure, and Sam mentioned that as well. Um, we also, uh, interestingly, for, to what uh, Antonia said, uh, we also embedded a new sensor in the head unit, making it easier to distinguish between head movements and eye movements. Um, I give you that. That is a little bit geeky, but it's quite exciting. It opens quite up. Uh, 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 it opens up quite a lot of new possibilities there. And finally, we've also created uh, an Android version. So lots of people have been working, waiting for that. We have created an Android version of our controller software so that you don't have to run around with the laptop when you actually do uh, data recording in the field. So um, that's quite nice uh, as well. And um, there is obviously a lot more to this uh, new uh, glasses hardware. Generally, they work very similar to the old ones when it comes to synchronizing the data. Um, and if you have any questions about the difference between the Glasses 2, Glasses 3, or any of our other Toby Pro products, then just feel free to pop me a quick message. And I'm handing over to Sam and the team now. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for sharing these very important highlights. Sounds very interesting. 